Not only are those people's rights being denied, but all the citizens throughout the member states of the EU are being denied the right to decide the future direction of Europe. And one of the things that annoys me really a lot in this country, and indeed it's happening in other countries, is it's an attempt to silence people or to keep them out. It's that you're anti-European. I hear this within my own party, and I'm just going to mention it about the Greens in a minute, but anyone who criticises the EU is anti-European. Now, I can stand up at any platform in this country, or indeed abroad, and criticise the Irish government, criticise the way the Irish that Ireland is run, and nobody has ever accused me of being anti-Irish. But criticise the EU, and you're anti-European. And it's a tactic used by the pressurised people into silence. But we're not anti-European, we're anti the direction Europe is going in and the type of Europe that's being created. And in fact, we're more pro-European than the people who are actually pushing this agenda, because yeah. they're the anti-European people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to mention a few things because I'm sure some people are wondering the uh, Green Party or whatever, you know. Like, I mean, I have to say, uh, it, it's a sad time for me because um, I fought very hard to, with the Irish government at the time that the Convention on Europe was set up, to get somebody from the no side. I was an MEP at the time and I lobbied very hard and I threatened Bertie Hearn that I was going to go public and have a big campaign if they didn't have one of the four people from the National Parliament on the no side. And as a result, we had John Gormley uh, representing the no side at the Convention on Europe. Um, and I have to say, it, it's disappointing now because at the time John was very much uh, had, had a very, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a uh, very um, progressive view. He uh, voted against the the, con the the constitution, which is what we're going to be voting on again, whether we like it or not. You know, almost all European leaders have agreed that this. The Lisbon Treaty is the EU constitution repackaged. Same thing, just in a different format. And John voted against that and instead signed the alternative document, the alternative proposal, which was much more progressive. Um, and I, it is disappointing, I have to say, that now the situation seems to have changed. But um, I think that, and I, I suppose well, the Green Party has to make a decision fairly soon on it, but I myself have nailed my colours to the mast a long time ago and said, regardless, I am going to be campaigning on this. And I think that everybody who cares about not just about the future of this country but about the future of Europe in general has to make an effort to get out there and to get the message across that this is about a real democratic Europe. We can do it and if we vote no this time we have to get across to the, all the Irish people that it, we can, we can uh, uh, make a difference because I think there's a worry out there. Look, we voted no before. What's going to happen this time? We'll just make us vote. As, as the quote up here, you know, they can be made vote uh, um, a second time or whatever but I don't think that would be the case because I think that there is enough public unease right throughout Europe that if there is a no vote in Ireland, things are going to change dramatically. Um, in relation to the Referendum Commission, I think that there are a number of points have to be uh, gotten across. Um, first of all, the whole issue of equality. And we had, there was the McKenna case, which was uh, started at the time of the Maastricht Treaty because the government were using huge amounts of public money to put up big billboards all over the country saying a vote against Maastricht will disempower woman, women and you know, vote for Maastricht for X funds or whatever it was, like blatant propaganda uh, information going out at taxpayers' expense. And we did go to the High Court at the time, but it didn't. We didn't get that far. But it, it, later in '95, it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that the government were wrong to use the public's money to persuade the public to vote in a particular way. Now. The Referendum Commission was set up, and I thought that was a good idea. But the problem was that the Referendum Commission, almost on all occasions where the Referendum Commission was used, it was never given a fair opportunity to do its job correctly, uh, properly, because in the Amsterdam Treaty you had the Amsterdam Treaty referendum and the Good Friday Agreement referendum, two huge issues, and there they had to deal with these two issues at the same time, in a very limited amount of time as well as that. So that was very difficult. Then you had the Nice one where you had uh, the Nice Treaty, you had the uh, abolition of the death penalty, I think it was, and um, the International Criminal Court, three different issues. So there has been a tactic by the government on every occasion to try and disempower the Referendum Commission and not allow it to do its job properly and effectively. Now, here is a chat. Unfortunately, yes, the other problem is that after Nice won, when the Irish people voted no, in their wisdom, despite what Bertie Ahern said, that they were confused, they voted no. What happened then? The government amended the 
the, the role of the referendum commission to take away from them the argument of giving out the yes, the, the role of giving out the yes no arguments. And I think that was a real tragedy and a denial of the right, of the people the right to have impartial information. Because when I say that, we on the no side can put out all the sort of leaflets we like and we put out all the information we like. And, and we have to admit it will be slanted in our direction and in our favour, the same as the yes side. Whereas what the referendum commission was able to do was to actually take the yes arguments, take the no arguments, and also look at them and look at whether they were actually legally correct or not, put them down and present them to the people. So you had the arguments on both sides vetted by legal experts, and that was there for the public to more or less have confidence in. And that has been taken away from the role, that role has been taken away from the referendum commission, and all they have now is the role of giving out the information about what the referendum is about. And as Tony said there, it's, it's crucial that at least in that respect they're given enough time and enough resources and also that there aren't two referendums on the same day making it almost impossible for the Referendum Commission to do its job properly because it is uh, really a huge issue on its own. This treaty, as has been said over and over again, it's extremely difficult to understand. There is no consolidated text, even for people who've been looking at it for months, including Jens Peter, who's the expert on it. You know, it, it's not a one standard alone simple issue. Therefore, I think it is one issue alone, and that's what we should have to vote on, and that's what the Referendum Commission should have, the role of looking at and giving people <laughs> the information on it. But in relation to um, equality, I think it's going to be a big thing during this campaign, because already you have the Forum on Europe, which was established after uh, the Nice referendum. And I'm just looking back over the last couple of years, and the Forum on Europe invite people along to speak. They've got their, you know, the, the, the special observer panel, and then they have the doll and Oroptus. And as time goes by, le there's less and less people on the no side. Just before the last election, on the no side, you had in the government or in the doll representation, you had the Green Party, uh, Sinn Féin, and the Socialist Party. Uh, now you don't even have that because the Greens have changed sides, more or less. Uh, Sinn Féin are there, but the Socialist Party are gone. So you only have one party represented, representing the no side in the official panel. And then on the Special Observer Pillar, you have a small number of organisations on the no side, including the National Platform, PANA, uh, the Workers' Party, and um, I think there was something else, and then the people's movement have now been accepted onto it. That's all you have. The rest of the organisations are all on the yes side, or if they're not on the yes side, they're very, very close to it. They might be officially declared yes. And that's the makeup of the, the Forum on Europe. Now, you look then at the invited speakers who've been invited to come along. The only person from the low side that I can remember in recent times being asked to come along was Jens Peter, and I think that's a couple of years ago. And you just look back at the panel of people they've had for the last couple of years, and they're all from the yes side. And not only from the yes side, but some of them are, you know, really ardent uh, Europhiles who are pushing a particular agenda. So you have the Forum on Europe to deal with. It's going to be going around the country now in the next while before the referendum, and I would urge anyone who, who hears about it to get there, go to the, to, to the public meetings they have, and make your voices heard loud and clear. The other thing is the Joint Oireachtas Committee on European Affairs, apparently, for the first time in the history of the state, has decided it's going to go around the country informing people about the referendum and about the treaty. Now, I really worry about this because how can a committee made up basically of parties all on the yes side, I'm not sure if Sinn Féin is on the European Affairs Committee, this probably, they may have a representative, but they may not. But how is that going to be impartial? That's taxpayers' money being used to fund the Joint Directors Committee to go around the country informing people on, on, uh, on the so-called so information on, on the treaty. Then, of course, outside of that, you have the whole issue of balance within the media. And again, you know, that is very, very difficult because we, as I think most people who are already involved in the campaign will find that it's like banging your head on a brick wall to try and get the no side message across because um, they're... The media basically seem to be coming from one direction, or the vast majority. It's going to be quite difficult, okay, with RTE and some of those, there will, there will be rules and uh, applied when the referendum itself is called. But you also can see, as you go along, subtle, uh, you know, campaigning going on behind the scenes. It's like almost like product placement or whatever. Um, the other point in relation to uh, there was another thing I want to mention, it's gone out of my head in relation to balance, but um, 
Yes, the European Commission, myself and Tony Cochran last year, I think it was, the, we, the, the European Commission offices here in Dublin funded ads on News Talk 106 and some other local stations around the country, uh, basically promoting how great the EU was. And